get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Big Book Study Workshop. Uh, we'll be keeping everyone muted for the duration of the workshop, with the exception of the facilitators, Tony R., Joe C., and myself, Joanne C. Uh, this is not a conventional AA meeting where we share our experience, strength, and hope with each other. This is a Big Book Study Workshop, the purpose of which is to take members of AA through the program of recovery as it's laid out in our basic text, Alcoholics Anonymous or more commonly known as the big book. We, will be refer we won't be referencing any other literature or versions of the 12 steps. Our aim is to help educate and challenge your beliefs about the program of recovery. So we might sift through some of the inaccuracies that circulate within our fellowship. Our aim is to challenge current beliefs by comparing them to what our basic text says. We simply wish to educate those who want to know more about our program of recovery. Um, for, We've, we've turned the Zoom chat off. Um, if you do send a message in the Zoom chat, it'll just come directly to the host. So if you get lost on whatever page we need to, we're on in the book, uh, feel free to ask, um, but your chat will not be distributed amongst um, all of the attendees in the group. Um, anyone behaving inappropriately or abusively will be removed from the workshop and uh, you won't be permitted to return. Joe, do you want to open us up with the set aside prayer? Uh, Joe, alcoholic. Hey, Joe. Set aside prayer. Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my disease, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Right on. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Tony. I'd like to welcome everybody. My sobriety date's April 8, 1989. It's um, pretty exciting times. Uh, we're on the fourth step kind of do a bit of a review kind of how many people have been working on the four step this week kind of with the exercise it's kind of interesting how many how much stuff we have on that list eh? when we sit there how many people spent more time thinking about the list than writing the list right so it's interesting right you get to see how you operate based on certain information so you're starting to be an observer so when we started this thing on page 63 we we well, they talk about we thought well before taking this step, making sure we we're ready, that we could at least abandon ourselves, meaning move in a new direction, right? We see the purpose and need of doing this. What is the purpose of doing the steps, right? Well, the purpose is, is to get a, a relationship with this power, because what's our dilemma? Lack of power. Where and how will we define this power that's going to create this change? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. So if I did exactly what they did, what would be the likelihood I'd get exactly what they've experienced, right? So I need to get the kind of same experience they have. And so we see this whole thing is really about, is about getting access to power, right? It's about forming a relationship with this power. So we see step three was an idea. It's a summary of the whole process. And by the time we finish this thing, we'll have completed the ideas in step three, the third step prayer. So we do the third step prayer. As we move through this, we did the list, and then we we seen what it, uh, the causes, and then we're we seen where it stemmed from in in the inventory process, in the resentments. We seen the third column how it affected itself, and then so we seen we can't have a resentment unless one of these areas are effect, aff, afflicted or affected. So this is where the resentment comes from, and then. You know, which was really challenging. We asked um, uh, the third, the fourth column to see how we set the ball rolling. How we initially, what they talked about on page 62, did not we ourselves set the ball rolling, right? We made decisions based on self that later placed us in a position to be hurt. So we see that in the fourth column here. And then they ask us, are we willing to set these matters straight? Tell ourselves the truth about what we discovered about these things. So we see the third step prayers in regards to us and the bondage that we have to our attachment to these things. We see the prayer on page 67 is about our attachment to other people, places, and things. So when these things crop up in our mind, it's asking us to start correcting it there to, to kind of reallocate that energy so it doesn't kind of uh, make us sick, right? Because when they talked about it, not only were we spiritually sick, they talked about from resentment uh, comes all forms of spiritual disease. So we see the spiritual disease is in association with the resentment, not alcoholism. It's actually in regards to our human condition. 
that we're making ourselves sick by hanging on to these things, right? So we need a way to find to be rid of these things if we're going to be free. And when they talked about these things on page 66, they talked about a lot, some pretty serious language there, right? In regards to poisoning ourselves by hanging on to these things and how these things kind of getting rid of self here. So we, they talked about here, we turn back to the, to the list for it held the keys to the future. On page 66, we're prepared to look at things from an entirely different view. So what's in the inventory process, what's the resentment portion for? What is the exercise for? You could write that on a separate piece of paper. So they're teaching us how to do something. What are they teaching us the purpose of the processes? Does that kind of make sense, Joanne? So what, what is the purpose of the process that they've been trying to teach us here? What is the purpose of the first part of the inventory process? Up until this point, the purpose is to teach us the recipe to um, overcome resentments. And to master them. So in order to master something, you need to acknowledge or see when it's happening. So you it's asking you to move from a participant or in bondage of this thing to an observer and to reallocate it and correct it with inside of yourself so it doesn't have energy and domain over you or where you're able to subside these things with inside of you. So on page 67, they talk about when we saw our faults, we listed them, we placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and we're willing to set these matters straight. Where's the first place these things need to be set straight? Inside of us. Right. So how many people, when you got to this stage, realized there was a lot of people, places, and things I still harbor or still hold a lot of energy around. Even though I was able to look at it, I still hold a lot of attachment to it. It has a lot of power or attachment to me still. How many people has those stuff with inside of them? They still have attachment to it, even though they see the kind of uh, uh, logically you could look at it, but emotionally you don't get the shift. Anybody have those things? So that means when these things come up again, as they will, they'll re resurface. What are we to do with these things when they resurface? To apply the recipe? Yeah, that's what the prayer is for, right? It, and when you apply that prayer, so what you're doing in essence is you're learning something that they've been trying to teach us, and they'll get even more detail later, is to be an observer of what's happening inside of you. And correcting it before you involve other people. You're reallocating this energy or this pain or this attachment, whatever you want to call it, this energy inside of you. You're starting to subside it by reallocating it. Or it's kind of like anybody ever seen one of those pressure cookers and it has that little valve on top, right? We never had that valve before, right? And when the pressure cooker went, all hell broke loose. Anybody have one of those things? So the four steps now, like a little pressure cooker, it's kind of like you feel it happening. And what you do is you kind of apply these things by pushing that button and it releases the energy with inside of you. And so thus not creating more havoc that they talked about on page 62, right? They talked about that we set, did not we ourselves create these things. So we're recreating a new reality with inside of ourselves. You want to add anything to that, Joe? Did we know, well, on 67, it talks about it on the bottom there, about fear, we can set the ball rolling. No, we're not there yet. I, I, you said that, though, didn't you? No, no on page 62. Okay, well, I'm good then. Okay, sorry, Joanne, go ahead. You wanna, do you want to recover 62? Yep, let's do that. Okay. So let's go back to page 62 for a few minutes, um, just so that we can see the information that they've given us before we started on the step four, right? Just so that we can review where we're at. Um, it's the selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that sometime in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So we're we, talking exactly yeah. about how self manifests its, itself in various ways. One of these ways is these resentments. 
and how we need to be able to master them. And they talk about here, we're going to see what, what self is made up of, right? It's our social, our instincts, right? So we see that actually these things are stemming from one of these areas in the third column. These are the whys. So when, when, when I did my list, my spouse said, why are you mad, mad at these people? I put down the cause. Now, when I finished it, when I got to the fourth column, why are you mad at these? Because they affected my self-esteem, my security. My, so I was able to see it from an entirely different angle. Where most, most of us, we try to deal with, with the symptom of the problem. Jealousy, anger, like the seven deadly sins is, is a byproduct of my instincts. It's not the thing. So I could try to deal with the symptoms, but it doesn't take care of the problem. Here, it goes right down to the problem. What's causing this? So we get the C now, and this is kind of what the second half they talk about here on page 62. So our troubles. That's okay. These are the causes and conditions the step four intends us to get down to, right? So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness, but we, mu we must, or it kills us. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. So, Many of us had- oh, Sorry. You wanna go ahead? Yeah, Many sure. Many of us yep. had moral or phys and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. So then when we get to this process, and when we got to page 64, they talked about we had to get down to cause and conditions, right? Alcohol is but a symptom. So we start to see where the cause and conditions are from is actually in the third column here. When you actually go through it, it's really interesting how these things are governing us. Right, our social instinct, our security, sex instinct, and our ambitions. These are the things that are driving us and motivating us. And that's why they, when they say there's no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid, is our attachment to one of these instincts that we try to create security on. Or we try to get other people to create security in these areas. How many people started seeing that here? That my attachment is actually because one of these, if anybody did these things to me, I'd just be as as uh, upset I'm trying to watch my language I'd just be as upset why because they're interfering with my instincts so I could change the names around and it have the same kind of effect on me does that kind of make sense so it's really interesting right and if I was spiritually fit in those areas would I have the same problem with these people places and things no, they're also trying to explain that it's not a matter of itemizing our own shitty behavior and then making a decision to actually change it ourselves. What they're saying is that we're, we lack the power to change it ourselves. So what you say makes sense. It's a matter of um, our, what our spiritual condition is. This is what is dependent on whether or not we experience these things from the inside out. Because then it shows you your human condition, you're more instinct-based. When you're spiritually reliant, you're more God-based or spiritually based. And when you're more spiritually based, you, you move into a different direction. You're not Neanderthal based. You're not instinct ran. So now you get to kind of get a good idea of that. So now they're going to get into the second part of this, which is, is quite interesting. And they're going to break it down even more, which is the fears. So do, why don't we start with we avoid retaliation or argument. Page so back, back on page 67, guys. Second paragraph. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Because that's the prayer that we're applying now to these internal matters that we still have attachment to, these arguments we still have inside of ourselves. Anybody still have those arguments with people who are not even there? Revisiting conversations, you should have said this, you should have done that. You're reliving, refeeling, rehash. Here they're saying we're going to subside that now. We're going to create a new dialogue, a new narr we have a new narrator other than you. Right? We're going to write a new script here. So when you see the screenplay coming, you're going to go stop. 
we're going to insert this new prayer or this new idea, and we're going to rewrite the story here on how I look at it and my attachment to it. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm recreating this reality with inside of myself through prayer and attachment. So I got two prayers now. The third step prayer is for me, and the prayer on page 67 is for other people, places, and things. Because what's the whole purpose of this is to get access to this power. What's the fourth step for is to start accessing that. And as I start going through it, I'll start going, well, I'm starting to get a bit of relief here. It didn't ask you, do you understand it? It's asking, you'll see how you start to experience it. And those of us who've been through it are 100% accurate on this. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrong others had done, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. That's hard to do, eh? No, we, our minds are naturally wired to, to focus on, on the wrongdoings of others. This is a, It's counterintuitive, this kind of exercise for us. We've spent most of our lives thinking and plotting against the people we think that have wronged us and deserve it. Most of us are really stuck to our story. Anybody here? Anybody got a dialogue in a story? Really and hard to change that story, eh? <laughs> Where were we to blame? <laughs> the inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and were willing to set these matters straight. That's it. Yeah, that's a hard one. And only you know what those items are when you look at it, right? So, you know, when, when you revisit that resentment, that harm, or that ill feeling, you could say, well, if I wasn't so dishonest or self-seeking, I wouldn't have ended up in that situation. If I wasn't so fearful, I would have probably left earlier. Anybody have that kind of story? So we see what really governs us now is these instincts. We're like you hear people say, Oh, I'm doing self will. No, self will is directing us. We're not directing it. We're a result of our self will. We don't subconsciously, we don't consciously say, oh, I'm going this way, that. Those decisions are already made for us. We're a byproduct of being driven by self. Right? We don't consciously, this is what we're looking at. It's wow. Consciously, I didn't mean for these things to happen, but this is what happened as a result of me being driven by these instincts or my inability to see these underlying things that are making my decisions for me. Anybody seeing that as they go through this? Pretty interesting, okay? Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances, circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did we not, did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why so, we had them. So this is interesting. So we do the same thing with the fears. We get a piece of paper folded in half. And now this is interesting because a lot of us, we, how many people like sticking to a story here? This is not about a story. This is about a list of items that come to mind that I'm fearful of. And it, so my first list, I put police falling on picket fences, being shot, right? Beaten up, relationship, being in a relationship, not being in a relationship, like on and on. Like, like it's just it may sound, even when you look at me, it may sound crazy, but how many different thoughts have you had during the day that involve some type of fear? How many people driving along thinking about a car accident that no car accidents on or death or some form of, of catastrophe that's taking, that might take place or could take place or something. You think of something outrageous continuously during the day. You think of all these different things that could go wrong at any given moment. You don't kind of realize that you're doing it because it's just 
such a part of you that it just doesn't happen. I don't know how many times I've be driving my car and I think about other cars swerving off the road or me not paying attention or driving up on a curb or something. A catastrophe always happening as a result of the circumstance I'm in. Anybody? Yes. So it's kind of interesting that evil and corroding thread, because I could go to myself self fearing no, not really, but this is where the list comes. So I sit there quietly and I just make a list, cutting my fingers off on the saw because I'm a carpenter, right? I do, like that stuff, like I think about, as I'm cutting, I think about all the time about losing my fingers in the saw as this thing is spinning. Sometimes I think about sticking my fingers in the saw, so I'm not crying. <laughs> like, and I get, and I'm shocked of my own thinking. Like what my, so make a list. Opening an emergency hatch mid-flight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I get crazy, crazy. Like I get, I know it's the id now, but I didn't know that at the time. I get these thoughts that would just panic, creep, give me anxiety. Anybody have thoughts within your own head that gives you anxiety? Because your brain's telling you, Joanne's laughing because it was a time like I'd, my wife would be traveling and I'd look at the exit door and a part of me would be, open it, open it. And, and, I, and I'd, I'd get a kind of like cold sweat, like uh, how I'd even think about that. Like I'd ponder opening the door for a second, right? Probably That's, more intense than that, the, the going through the whole entire thought process of, of what would happen if. Right. And and in this moment where where this thing that's actually not happening again, like you would experience the resentment and sort of lose time. It's like it's really happening. Your heart rate, your heart rate quickens. You're experiencing as if it's happening and it's not happening. And this is the, the source of a lot of our anxiety. And then suddenly in the moment, somebody wants to interact with you on a social level and you're in the grips of this very intense fear. Um, it, it would it would wreak havoc with with your daily life, right? And and like you said, you're so used to it that you don't even know it's happening. That noise, that that situation, the way your brain operates. So here they're saying we're going to make a list, and then what do we do with that list? So everybody got their four step inventory in front of them. This is going to be a little different on how we do this one. Right. Just a little quick announcement. The four-step oh. inventory sheets are, are the last pages on package two of the Big Book Study Workshop sheets. They mirror the exercise in the Big Book. Um, if you don't have them, uh, we can email them out to you or um, you can get them through the YouTube channel page. So we, um, um, 30 years ago, 31 years ago, I got taken through the Joe and Charlie, which was really good generically approach to it and they had the four-step inventory sheets we've changed the sheets to more represent a more in-depth study it into what the book says so these are done out of vancouver our big book study workshop and they reflect the book more which is kind of interesting because most four-step sheets are all generically the same but as you go through the four step it actually changes the approach to it, right? And it's going to be really interesting. And this is one of the areas it starts to change in. So we'll, when we look at the wording here, we'll start back. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. And that's what we just said. So just think you have a separate piece of paper over here with all your fears, everything that comes to mind. And if you got start anxiety, just do the third step prayer and then revisit it. The exercise is just to see what your conscience tells you. Your conscience will tell you the, the problems that you suffer from. Anybody ever notice that? When you ask yourself a question, it has no problem giving you, it just shows up. I don't know how it works, but it kind of like your conscience will tell you all the obstacles within itself. If you sit quietly and start writing them down, you could only think of one thing at a time. That's why you make the list, okay? We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. So here's what a lot of people usually go with the fear. The reason I have this fear because when I was seven or when I was eight 
or when they try to associate it back in time. Well, fear is based on an instinct. It's based on one of your instincts. And the only time you can really experience fear is in the now. It's something of the possibility that happens now. It's an instinct based that, that creates the fight or flight. Anybody have that? It's an instinct based thing. So what they talk about here, so when you take the fear, so the first one, we'll just say I'm injuring myself at work. So I put that here, and the next, why do I have it? Well, because it could be my self-esteem, right? My, my material, emotional, um, and ambitions. So one of these areas are interfered with. I'm thinking if I get hurt, will it affect my self-esteem and how I think other people think of me? Will it affect my personal relationships at work and the people I'm working with? Will it affect my material? Will it affect my emotional? Will it affect my acceptable sex relations? Yeah. I mean, if you're injured, right? Will it affect my hidden? We'll leave that alone. Will it, and then my ambitions. What about my ambitions? What about socially? Will it affect me socially? Yeah, so would it affect my security and sexual? Depending, you know, where you're at, depending on the injury and what happened. Like, so it didn't affect all the... So where does this fear come from? It's coming from one of these instincts. So I'm going across the page. So why do I have... So then it asked me, why do I have this fear? Because it's... Am I being self-reliant or God-reliant? Simple. Why do I have this? Because I'm being self-reliant. Right? If I was God-reliant, right, then I'd be taking precautions. I'd be working within the safety measures. I'd be in the moment and I'd be present. Then I wouldn't have this fear, would I? Right? And I'd be able to subside it. So it says, was it because self-reliance failed? Yes. Why am I having this fear? Because I'm anticipating something really bad happening. So who am I concentrating on is me, right? So there's certain fears that are actually good. Getting hit by a bus. What would be help you not getting hit by a bus? To stay off the street. There's certain instincts that kind of, that you need to kind of, well, you know, when I'm going too fast on my bike, a part of me will say, slow down. You're supposed to listen to that instinct, right? And kind of like, but what they're talking about, being in a relationship, why am I fearful of that? Self-reliance, because of one of my, not being in a relationship. Why do I have that? Because I'm God-reliant or self-reliant? Self-reliant, getting a job, losing a job. Anybody have a list like that? So why do I have these, these problems? When I go across the list, I see, is, do I have this because I'm self-reliant or God-reliant? Not because what happened when I was seven. Not because what happened when I was eight. See how we like to attach things? Here we're seeing they arise out of ourselves. What part of self is creating this fear? Ah, so that's interesting. And if I was spiritually fit, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and, and emotionally, right? Physically. So if I was spiritually fit, would I be having these problems in these areas with these fears? So it's interesting now, right? So the more self-reliant I become, the more fear-based I become because I go back to the instinct-based living. So the more instinct-based I become and more self-reliant I become, the more anxiety, fear-based I become. The more consumed with who? Self I am because self is anticipated, which is a part of our human nature is to have that. But when it's driving us, it, it, out, it outperforms its... Like we're no longer in that, that animal state that we were way back a long time ago when this stuff would be being on high alert all the time. You it don't surpasses need surpasses its intended purpose. It's you know, it's like if having a healthy fear of being hit by a bus might stop you from crossing the road against a light, but if it prevents you from leaving your house, it's the improper function of fear. So we see some of these instincts are starting to outgrow their usefulness, right? And they may have been good 2,000 years ago for me to be on high alert and waiting. But if I'm sitting in my living room and I'm always fearful of a home invasion, right? And I'm like, you all want to know how spiritual you are. Is how far away is the baseball bat from you, the, the bedroom, right? Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> so what do we do now? Well, perhaps there is a better way. 
thank God. <laughs> Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. So when when is this relationship happening? Later or now? Now. Now. May you find him now. That's what the decision we made in three. To start this relationship so we can start getting relief when? Now or later? Now. now. I need to find an answer to the dilemma called self now. Because later is no good for me. I'm not a later kind of person. Anybody a later kind? Of, who, who wants this stuff now or later? When would you like it, sir? Now or later? Now. Everything about my life is now. I want it now. Right? And so that's what may you find them now. So they're talking about where is this relationship taking place inside. I'm starting to, to see the benefit of prayer. I'm starting to see that I'm starting to get a little relief from myself by doing these things. Where before I never had relief. It's kind of interesting. When I apply prayer, I seem to get relief when, in the areas that when I don't apply prayer, I seem to have more problems. This thing of prayer seems to work in a way that I don't understand, but I seem to experience it. And so that's all the understanding I seem to need. It's one of those things you start discovering for yourself. So you started this based on other people's ideas and experience, but now you begin to have this experience of what they're talking about. It's kind of like, hmm, isn't this interesting? Okay, do you want to add anything up, Joe? Nope. Do you want? No, good, thanks. Okay. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns, just to the extent that we do as he would have us and humbly rely on him. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? So, you have, you have, and how many people have been to a topic meeting here? <laughs> how many people has brought up or heard someone brought up the, the, what's God's will for us? How many people has heard that as a topic? How many people heard this as the solution? This is what God's will for us. So for the first time, it tells us what God's will for us is. In the third step, it was an idea. But now they're starting to say, this is what God's will is for you. Anybody see where that says that? I like the topic meetings where to the topic is serenity and then everybody shares for an hour on how they're keeping themselves serene. But here it says, just to the extent that we do as he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? Meaning that serenity is the result of something, not something we can conjure up on our own. So on page 62, if we back up here, and we'll finish off with what Joanna was reading earlier. Right? Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness bus by wishing or trying on our own. Why don't you go from there, Joanne? Um, Page 62, down yeah, near the bottom. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. So we need a certain combination to, to be entirely free from self. It is possible, but we can't do it on our own. So once we get this recipe, we can actually f experience total freedom from self, which is pretty cool. How many people find that pretty cool? How many people would like a break for themselves for a little while? <laughs> yeah, <right>. Bingo! <laughs> no. <laughs> Go ahead. We never apologize to anyone. We're back on 68 now. Nope, nope, back on. You want to go back to 62? Yeah, keep going, yep. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. So how many people tried not to be fearful, not to think of anxiety, not to think of problems here? And the more you try not to think about it, the, you ever notice the more you think about it? The more you say, I don't want to talk about this or think about this, the more you find yourself thinking about it? You, by the time you become aware you're thinking about, you're already thinking about it. So you see how self, that, that the consciousness works. You don't go to yourself, well, let's go over some anxieties-based thinking. You're already in the anxiety-based thinking. You see it has you, you don't have it. You see, you kind of like, oh, as an observer, you, you realize these things take place. And by the time I become aware of it, I'm well in it already. Right? Go ahead. You want to go back to 68? No, nope, nope, keep going. On? This yeah. is good. Go on 62? Yep. 
This is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. So God was going to, when does the direction happen? In the moment, right? When the director is running a, a film set, he's giving everybody direct in the moment how to run the next scene and, and, and how one scene will go into the other. He knows how the sequence is going to go together for this film, to narrate this film, to be the narrator. Does he not? Yes. So all the people on the set and the lights and about all the people around, if they just pay attention, then they'll be able to create a new narrative or a new story or the story that they're hoping to gain here, right? He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. There we go. So, most good ideas are simple, and this was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. So, it talks about here on page 68, perhaps there's a better way. Better way than what? Than the way we've been doing things. Now they're going to give us a recipe on how to do that. It has to be a recipe, because remember, if it just moral psychology or a better philosophy of living or acceptance and surrender was enough, then we wouldn't need to learn the recipe that they talked about on page 64 is that that needs to become a working a part of the mind. We need to find a new way of, of, of processing our thinking, our ideas, or our life, right? We had to find this new inventory process that needs to become a working part of the mind so I could have a different experience that they talked about on page 64 that they're showing me now. So the first part was mastering resentment. So now this is the second part of the inventory process through prayer. So we're in the, we are in the world to play the role he assigns. When does the assignment happen? In the here and now. So I need to be present. That means I need to be where my feet are. I don't know how to do that on my own because I don't spend a lot of time in the present. Anybody here? I'm usually somewhere in the future, I'm in the past, daydream. I'm usually somewhere other than in the moment here, free from all attachment, right? Usually I'm, I'm narrating some idea, some story, I'm caught in some dialogue that has me away from where I am, right? And when I'm away from where I am, I'm a little more anxiety-based. Anybody have an anxiety-based experience here of living? That means anxiety. When I'm thinking, anybody ever notice... When you're thinking, you ever notice your breathing is a little more shallow, a little more irritable, you're a little not so pleasant to be around. And with all this isolation, how many people find you even hard being around yourself, never mind being around anybody else, right? Because now you're getting a good idea of your own thinking. Yay, anybody want to start the wave and keep it going that way? No, we're good? Okay. You want to go back to 68? Oh, yeah. Where do you want to start from? Let's go, perhaps there's a better way based on that thinking. Perhaps there is a better way, we think so, for we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns, just to the extent that we do as, he think, as we think he would have us and we humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. What does that mean? That the solution to outgrow our fears, the experience of serenity is coming from this power, the relationship with this power. It's not something we conjure up on our own. But why does it say match calamity with serenity? What calamity are they talking about? The internal calamity. So now they're saying I have a solution to what's happening inside to match something. When you're matching something, that means... One's not governing you anymore. You're, it's an even playing field. You're not being driven by it. If you're not being driven by it, that means you're more present and able. To, if you're able to stay present, that means you're able to more reconstruct your life, right? Because if you could take care of the moments, right? The moments turn into hours. The hours turn into days. The days turn into weeks. The weeks turn into months. The months turn into years, right? How did we get to where we are, right? Moments. That turned into hours, that turned into days, that turned into years. And sooner or later you look back and go, how did I get here? 
driven by all these things and coupled with alcoholism, I end up in a place of total bewilderment. So here they're saying we could reallocate the whole story within a few within a short time period. And they talk about that in the spiritual appendix in the back of the book. What usually takes place in a few months could seldom take place by years of self discipline within a few years. So if I'm willing to do this recipe within a short period of time, and now I'll find I can start getting relief from myself and re-narrating my story for a new experience. That's pretty wild stuff. What makes, well, does it say, do you know this? No, but I know those who went before me tell me this is true. This is the recipe. If I'm willing to apply this now, I'll get relief when? Now. Now. So it's pretty cool stuff, right? So now it's telling me that what it meant, said earlier, to the precise extent that I permit these things. So now I'm an observer of my thinking. I see these things coming to pass. I see how it has attachment to my energy and my consciousness. I get to participate whether I want to stay in that or do I want to step back from it and apply the recipe. Well, have they given us the recipe yet? They're about to. We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. So here, here's something that the fellowship started. You notice a lot more people are starting to apologize for believing in God in AA? I don't want to offend anybody. My God, am I understand? It's just like, by the time you work through we agnostics, you shouldn't apologize for your belief in God. Because we're really, like you hear you hear people say, oh, um, how, how's that? I was reading it the other day. It's kind of interesting how our view is. It says, as, as uh, between me and God, as the result of me and God, I'm here. Instead of, as the result of my relationship with God, I'm here. I'm here. I I've, I've, would never be able to create the life that I have regardless on my own. I've had to tap into something greater than me to be where I am and experiencing the life I am. So I'm here as the result of my relationship with something greater than me because I would have never been able to create the life that I have. So the recipe here, what's the recipe? They talk about, so we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and to direct our attention to what he would have us be at once. At once. What does that once mean? Right now. Right now. At once we commence to outgrow fear. So you hear people say, oh, you can't have two, feel, two emotions in the same house, fear and, and faith. Well, you don't live in our house, do you? In our house it's saying that you can have enough faith to outgrow the fear. That means enough enough access to this power to get out of the chair where you weren't able to get out of the chair before. Enough faith to kind of move you forward where before you would have been crippled by your own thinking. So the recipe here, this is the fear prayer. This is the recipe that the whole book's been designing us. Anybody see the recipe that the whole book's been bringing us up to? This is the design of the whole book, this prayer. Anybody see what that is? When you look at it. So, Do you want me to read it again? Yeah. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. So there's the recipe. So the, the principles of steps one, two, and three is... The principle of step one is, what is the problem? In step one, we tell you what the problem is on alcoholism. And then it turns into a principle where you start diagnosing what the problem is. Step two, the principle is, what is the solution to this specific problem? Step three is, what's the spiritual course of action am I determined to take? Am I going to pursue a spiritual remedy or am I going to go it alone? So step two is, what is the spiritual solution to this problem? 
right, once we go through these principles. Step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, right? We try to carry this message to alcohol and practice these principles. So here, the principle is, that they're asking us, we ask him to remove our fear. In order to remove something, what's the first thing you need to be able to do? Observe or acknowledge it. You, now you become an observer of something that's happening inside of you where before you're a participant, you feel this energy shift. Like, Whoa, what's going on here? You kind of, instead of it being inside, it's kind of weird, but you take it, it's like inside of you, and you take it and go, well, you put it in front of you, you see it's there, and then you apply the prayer for the removal of it, and, and right? So you're shifting your energy and your attachment to it, and then you ask for strength to do the next right thing. What's the next right thing? It could be whatever is in front of you. I had a lot of sponsors go, I asked for this prayer to be removed. I don't know what the next right thing to do is. I said, are you at home? They said, yeah. I said, have you done the dishes in the last week? They said, no. I said, start with the dishes. How's that going to help? Let me know after. They finished the dishes. They said, well, I feel a little better. But now what do I do? I'm still full of fear. I said, well, have you done your laundry in the last month? They said, no. I said, well, do your laundry. And then clean your head, they clean their house, and it's like, wow, this seems to kind of work. I, I get guys full of anger. He says, I'm so crazy right now. I said, pray, go wash your face with really cold water. They go, how's that going to help? Well, they go wash their face with really cold water, and it snaps them back into the moment. They forget what's going on, and that's what prayer does. It brings you back into the moment so you could reallocate your thinking, your emotions, and your direction. Does that kind of make sense? So they talk, when we look at here, they talk about, we ask him to remove our fear. That means I have to acknowledge what the fear is and what's attached to. Why am I having this? My social, my ambitions, my security, my self-esteem, something's interfering here and it has a hold of me. I'm starting to become instinct-based, anxiety-based again, and there's nothing really going on here. So give me direction. If I'm driving my car and I'm starting to feel anxiety or I'm in my bike and I start feeling anxiety, I pray and come back into the moment and practice the principles to enable me to better do what I'm doing. When I'm at work and I have to cut certain material a certain way that causes me anxiety, I pray. And then, then I go back to the principles of being able to do it effectively by concentrating on what I'm doing, not being distracted in my own mind. It's like anybody ever drive in a snowstorm here or in a storm, right? So the storm gets your attention that there's something happening. Inside the car, what do most people do? They stop, they sit up, they go back to the basis. They turn down the radio, everybody in the car becomes quiet, and everybody's looking straight ahead. <laughs> you, know, you know that? And that's kind of the redirecting your focus. And everything. So it's circumstances that allow you to do that. But here, it's something inside of you that does the same principle, right? It's something that's, that has the potential of robbing you of moments and pleasure and gives you anxiety, you're able to reshift this focus. So they talk about here, well, and uh, remove our fear and to direct our attention to what he would have us be. When? In that moment, if I'm at work, what would God want me to do in that moment at work? Okay, keep going. Okay, I did something. I it's seen. Fine. Okay, so if I was at work, what would God want me to do in that moment at work? Be at work. If I was enjoying a relate with my kids or my family or people, what would God want me to do in that moment? How many people talk themselves out of happiness here or situations? How many people are unable to be, participate in the moment of things that are happening because of anxiety or fear-based information, things that are happening? I remember times with my kids, my inability to be present with my kids because of stuff that was happening with their mother or people around them or money or property prison. And then what happens is I rob my moment with my kids or I'd be at work worrying, worrying about finances, right? I was having problems. I'd go home. I'd leave work and go home because I'm so worried about my finances. Nobody that like, like that here, right? So fear governing my life. So what happens is being present. If I if it was 11 o'clock at night and, and it was like I had to work the next day, what would God want me to do? Set the alarm clock. Go to sleep. What would fear want me to do is sit and watch more TV and create a distraction. 
So the prayer is to be involved in that. How many people like causing distractions here that cause them more problems? So here they're saying, I'm, I'm creating a different relief of one that won't cause my demise. Remember, it's spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. As I start getting relief from these things, at once we commence to outgrow fear. That's pretty wild. To outgrow something means something's still present. It's like a wall in front of me that I'm not able to get over. As the result of the prayer and the shifting of my ideas, the wall becomes smaller and I become tall enough to step over it. Does that kind of make sense? Where before I would be crippled by my own anxiety and not leave the house. Here I pray and I understand that. And I just ask for the courage to do the next right thing. To get me to that meeting. To make that phone call. Anybody have anxiety when they think about phoning people here? Or doing something? How many people talk to themselves out of happiness here on a continuous basis? Here they're saying that's a fear-based understanding. So here is pray. God, give me the strength to do the next. Relieve me of the bondage so I can throw that prayer in there. But give me the strength. So this prayer is to the point now. You notice the third step prayer was quite long. You know, this prayer on page 67 was even longer. You notice how long the, the prayer is on, on uh, fear? It's to the point. So that means hopefully it becomes a working part. And what that kind of looks like is... If, imagine if you had a moving company and, and you're working with three new people, right? And three of you started the first day on the job. It'd be really awkward moving and getting things happening and getting people working in sync with each other, right? It'd be a lot of communication, a lot of anxiety, a lot of things getting things. It'd be really awkward. As the time went on, it'd get to a point where it'd be just a working part. You'd more, work like more of a team. You ever see a team work together? Guy grabs one side of the table. The other guy just grabs the other side of the table. It doesn't have to be told. And that's where this exercise becomes a more working part of the mind in step 11 but i need to understand this application now how well i do this application now will determine the rest of my sobriety especially in step 11 because this is getting access to that power right where it becomes making that shift through the keystone where with inside of me so i'm going from a instinct-based living to more of a prayer-based directional do something you notice there's an action attached to this thing. You just don't sit there and meditate and concentrate because you're not good left to your own devices. Anybody here? Your alone time is not really good for you. Anybody find good quality time sitting talking to you all day? <laughs> <laughs> you want to add to that, Joanne? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so I'm good. So, yeah. so we know how to go through this now, right? Any questions in the chat? Anything in no. regards to this? No, I think we're we're doing all right. Um, do you? Yeah, we did page. We did. Perhaps there was a better way. Do you want to move on? It's only ten to seven now. So that exercise is really cool. This exercise, a lot of people don't know how the four step ties into step eleven. Right, Because step 11 becomes a working part of the mind. I need this recipe. I need to be able to, to um, outmaneuver my own thinking through the application of these things. So this is what we, I call it spiritual martial arts. Right, Is the reallocating of my thinking and my ideas. Anybody see the benefit of being able to do this? Or the benefit of practicing this? The relief of it? Because imagine if you're taking care of the moments... What will the next hour look like? A lot better. If the next hour is looking, how long would it take before you look back and you start having a different experience with your life? Right? Because where does the story need to change in order for me to have a different story? It has to change with inside of myself. The narrator, I need a new narrator. Anybody know what a narrator is? What's a narrator, Joanne? Somebody telling the story. So anybody, how many people need a new narrator in their mind? A new person telling you a new story? A new dialogue. Right? So this is the new dialogue. How many people just want to move on to sex now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll still block you from the page. Okay, so. I bet you Joe, I bet you Joe chimes back in now. 
Right, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you there, Joe? No. Okay, no, so we're moving on to sex. <laughs> so I, I'm so here on the column we go across. We see the third column on this one is was it because self reliance failed us? Yes or no, right? And then it talks about read page sixty eight. Perhaps there's a better way. We think so. And then the, you get that. Is there a better way? And what is the better way? Trusting and relying upon God. How? Where's the only place I could trust and rely upon God? Where's the only place God is present? Now. Now it's always now. There's no there's no later to this stuff. It's all now. May you find him now, right now. How many times do they mention now? Quite a bit, right? Because when we look for relief, how many people in the past would look for something that oh you take it now and and a week from now you get relief. How many people wanted relief now? This is better than anything you've ever taken. Because this doesn't lead to your demise. So it starts to be a substitute. What we used to use for a solution with people, places, and things. All those things that we use. How many people have a list of things that we use to make ourselves better that make ourselves feel worse? How many people have dialogue with themselves? and I shouldn't be doing this. Why am I doing this? So that means I don't have the power to do the things I want to do. And I don't have the power to stop myself from doing the stuff I don't want to do. Anybody have that problem? It's so funny when you start talking to yourself and you realize you're doing stuff against your own will. And I'm not even talking about drinking anymore. I'm talking about everyday life stuff where you look at some of us could look at the dishes or look at things we need to do. But there's something inside of us that doesn't shift over to doing that. Or we're doing something over here that we should be doing over here. We're not meeting our responsibilities. We're not meeting our emotional connections to people, places, and things. And we're in conflict with ourselves. Anybody have that conflict and that dialogue? And anybody doing things is kind of like, why am I doing But you can't stop yourself from doing it, like driving aimlessly like it's on and on. Each of us have our own personal stuff. Here is where we start creating the shift. You acknowledge these things with inside of yourself that cause you this, this concern or displeasure. And why are we having them? Is it because we're instinct-based or spiritually based? We're instinct-based. So now for the first time what we're getting here is called the pause. We, there's actually three instincts. But most people talk about two instincts. The fight or flight. How many people have heard of that? You just put up your hand a bit. You hear the fight or flight, right? So actually now we're getting something which is called the pause. The pause, freeze, don't move. And that's one of the instincts for survival. Sometimes you have to fight, sometimes you have to flight, and sometimes you have to not move. You ever see animals, sometimes they don't move at all, they just stay, they stay put. When I walk my dog, I, I got a doby. And, and, he's, and he's always on high alert. And sometimes there's rabbits in the bush. He doesn't see it, and the rabbit doesn't move. As soon as the rabbit moves, the dog sees him, and the dog's after him. Does that kind of make sense? So a part of his survival technique is not to move. And this is what this part is here, is the pause. The pause from what? The pause from page 67. Set, setting in motion trains of circumstances that bring us misfortune. So now we're getting the recipe based on our instincts and based on these things to create a different outcome to things that used to cause us problems. Pretty cool, right? I think it's, it's a game changer. So let's get into sex. <laughs> Page 68. <laughs> Talking about fear. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> So this, this, this is, this is going to be really interesting. You want to keep an open mind. on. We're just going to do the first part of the exercise here. And then because there's a lot to this section that, that most people just skip through. Well, most people, when they do the sex inventory, they do an immoral inventory. And that's not the purpose of this thing. This is, this is kind of like the chapter We Agnostics. It's kind of like that because what you're doing is you're going to navigate through your own thinking to find peace with your own sexuality or your own humanness to make peace with your past and to give you a good idea for the future. It's to reallocate how you think, feel, and what drives you. Go ahead. Now about sex. 
Many of us needed an overhauling there, but above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex. <laughs> Put your hands down, everybody. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Not taking requests. <laughs> Not taking requests. <laughs> <laughs> who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it, or that it is not the right kind. They seem they, they see it significant. Well, where did you go, Joanne? You back? I think she got booted. Joe, you here? They all abandoned me. Kim, you here? Kim's here. Joe's sleeping, I think. Joe said, I don't know where Joanne... Did you want to pick up where Joanne left? You got your book? I got my book. Where are we? We're, we're on sex, page 69. I don't know we if are. that was intended or not, but... <laughs> there's a sense of humor there, right? All right, where were we? Then, Screaming for sex and more sex? <laughs> sure, that's always a good place to start. <laughs> Show of hands? Okay. <laughs> then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage. Hang on, somebody got to close that door. Sorry, it's 7 o'clock, they do that thing. Yep. Um, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. So that's, an, that's a nice way of saying, mind your own business. Right? Like back when I was getting sober, they said, no relationships for the first year. I thought, what an order. I can't go through with it. Like, you know, like, you know, there's nothing appealing about that kind of sobriety. I tell you, like, forget it. <laughs> like, I ain't gonna. So that's the arbitrators of people. So a lot of people sponsor people and they want to become their, their arbitrators of their sex conduct in their lives, right? It's not our business is just to take them through an inventory where they can find peace in what they're doing, right? That's our whole thing. It's between us and God, right? Go ahead. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. You notice but, it you notice it didn't say we'd hardly be alcoholic if we didn't. Human. We're dealing with the human problem. Resentment, fear. We're dealing we're not dealing with alcoholism now, because that's above our pay grade. What we're dealing with is the human dilemma that caused our alcoholism. Does that kind of make sense? Because why did I drink? Why did I like the solution? Because I liked the way it made me feel. And it worked to my detriment. And I couldn't stop drinking after a while. So then it became beyond my pay grade to deal with. Beyond human power. So then I need a new power to remove this element. To find a new solution to the dilemma called who? To the dilemma called self. So I need to find a new way of conducting my life. That I find a solution. Um kind of adequate enough that I get relief from my life where it used to be alcohol anybody does that kind of make sense so I'm looking to deal with the human dilemma here what can we do about them what can we do about them well we reviewed our own conduct over years past where had we been selfish dishonest or inconsiderate whom had we heard? Okay, so this this is this is this is how we do the inventory, because it's very tricky the wording and everything through here. A lot of people get different ideas. So there's two there's two things here. The first part, um, first part is, is you're going to get a piece of paper like this. This is very very important because the next part, the first part is they talk about. Where were we selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate, right? So they're asking us specifically on not things that I've done, 
Like, you know, if I'm in the bondage and someone else is in the bondage and we both agree to it, and that's not what they're talking about. Here they're talking about, when I look back over my past, where was I selfish and considered dishonest or inconsiderate? And then I could have attachment to a lot of things from my past, and it doesn't even have to involve another person. It could be shame, guilt, and remorse that I'm carrying that could be left with selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. My first sexual experience was selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. And I was alone. So never mind. So, <laughs> so it talks about here. And frightened, but I won't get into that. So so what they're talking so my sponsor said is very difficult. So here you notice it's it's if you look at the resentment sheets, the first one. You notice it's the last column that we're starting with. We're not starting with the first column. We're starting with the last column here. Where was I selfish and considerate and dishonest? Right? Now I'm starting with that column first because my subconscious will tell me where I was selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. How many people are thinking about a past situation where they were selfish, inconsiderate, or dishonest? Your conscious will let you know. So... When I did the list, what I did was was the Greyhound bus. I know what I'm talking about. Nobody else knows what I'm the Greyhound bus. I was raised Roman Catholic, so um, porn uh, magazines were a big problem back then. Going through growing up, you know, so it caused guilt, shame, and remorse because of the church's teaching and all. So I'd put down the magazines. I'd put down pornography. I'd put down. Oh, I remember this person. I put the blonde, and then I put Kim, and then I put Sam, and then I put whatever comes to mind. I just make a list of people, places, the, the RIO Theater, right? The Sagamore. Nobody else knows them, but my conscience is reminding me of these situations where it caused guilt, shame, and remorse, where I was selfish and considerate or dishonest. Anybody have those things coming to mind now as you revisit the past? How many people have something coming to mind? Just a show of hands. See how your subconscious works? We talk about, and your conscious goes, here, look at this thing. Look at this. So we're going to take care of those things that not necessarily involve a relationship, but involve something I'm still carrying, some energy, some form of shame, guilt, or attachment to one of those things. And it's nobody else's inventory but mine. So when I put, when I put the Ford Mustang, does anybody know what I'm talking about? I know what I'm talking about. And so I could create the story after that. So I make a list of all these things. And there was, it was kind of weird how, how a lot of them would, would come to mind. In, in some, even though when I did my fifth, and the guy I did my fifth was, was awesome. And then, and then later, when I was sober, I had to go for some outside help in this area because of my background. What, what our inventory is trying to do is, is find peace with all these things that used to drive me or cause me game sh um, shame and remorse, right? So when I went through this, it took care of a lot of those items that I was able to make peace with, right? And so it's kind of like, like, you know your inventory, right? You know these things, right? And so what my inventory would look like may be a little different than yours, but a lot of those same things would be on the list, especially going through puberty, self-discovery, and all this stuff being on your background, the people you grew up with, the association, all. a lot of this stuff would cause problems there, right? You look When you look back, you think about these moments. I think of Lauren. I think of foster care. I think of the reform school. I think of these things that come to mind. In the time, they seemed all right. But now looking back, they carry some guilt, shame, and remorse with it. It could be even like so, you know, it may be funny, like saying, you know, if you somebody was to put down, oh, masturbation, you think it causes you guilt, shame, and remorse, but it's a very human part of being human and conduct and, and expanding as a person. But a lot of people would feel guilt, shame, and remorse based on other people's teaching around that. Right? And so here I'm gonna find a place where I could be my own conduct and be at peace with it. But first I need to get rid of all the shit that I'm carrying. Does that kind of make sense? So make the list. The first list is all the stuff that, that I carry that I'm not right with, where I was selfish, inconsiderate, or dishonest. I added where it caused shame, guilt, or remorse. Kind of It adds to those things of dishonesty, inconsiderate, or dishonest. Places where I was coercing. 
you know, you know how we could be coercing in, in a relationship, manipulative and all this other stuff. You'll have attachment to those things when you look back on it. Anybody? So you make a list. This is the interesting part now. So when you look at the sex conduct here, everybody got this sheet? You see the sex conduct? So now I have where I was selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate. I have a list of people, places, and things. I could even have myself on that list, right? Of causing myself guilt, shame, or certain conduct that causes me problems. But I don't want to be revealing on it on, on a piece of paper that's going to be lying around that somebody else might get a hold of it. I'll know what it is, right? So then what do we do with that? Hey, Joanna, welcome back. Hello. Just took a little break. <laughs> okay. So let's go. We reviewed our fears. Okay. We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness? Where were we at fault? So this is this is good. Whom had we hurt? Isn't that interesting? So, so first one I'm going to put down here just for exercise wise. So in this column here, right, which would be whom the, that I hurt, it would be Kim, right? I was selfish and considerate, but not only did I hurt Kim, I could have hurt her parents, her brother, her sister, people. Over, so the people. Like, you know, if Kim was in my home group and, and she was new and I got involved with her, who in the home group did I also affect? So I could see there's a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of people here that I could have hurt. Does that kind of make sense? So not only Kim, if Kim had kids, if Kim, right? So all these people, anybody other than your partner or the person you're with, get involved in your relationship, the police, how many people had police, parents, loved ones get involved in, in mishaps? So you see, wow, there's a lot of people starting to be interfered with by this certain selfish and considered dishonest. So if I was this selfish and dishonest, say if I had an affair with Kim, on Kim, hypothetically, well, I'm inconsiderate, self-seeking, dishonest, and selfish, right? Whom did I hurt? Well, I not only hurt Kim, I hurt myself, I hurt her kids, I hurt her mom, I hurt her dad, I hurt her brothers at work, on and on and on. So I could see through this one act, I have 15 people. So it's kind of interesting. Now, now I see why all these people are treating me the way they are. So if I had been going to a home group when I was new and my sex instinct was out of whack, and then what I see, I don't, my sex instinct isn't out of whack. What I really have is a, I have a problem with my self-esteem that I use sex for security, to right? Because the old idea was was job, relationship, money, car, prestige. These were the list of things that created security that made you a man, right? And so the pursuit of those things would cause me a lot of harm and the people around me a lot of harm. Anybody? So same with a lot of women. How many women get involved with people to create security? How many men get involved with people to create security? So we see we have the same problem. It's a trade-off. Right? That we cause ourselves a lot of problems because of one of our instincts are out of whack. So I get, what did I do? Well, have a fair. So that one thing could affect all these people. Right? And then I go across the list. Why did I do these things? Was it because of my self esteem, personal relationship, material emotion? So when I go across the page, I see what's created this problem. Right? And what I see it, where they talk about, are we willing to straighten these matters out if we can? The answer is yes. Where they say, what could I have done instead? Not back then, but now when these things happen. What I should have done back then, what I couldn't have done. If I was spiritually fit, none of these stuff would have happened. I wouldn't have been driven by instinct. I wouldn't have been driven by th these things inside of me looking for a sense of ease and comfort involving other people to create security within my own life. And then I wouldn't hurt all these people, right? So I'd create, be God more reliant. If I'm more God reliant, then I'm not looking for these people, places, and things that cause relief. And it doesn't mean I still don't do it, but not as much. So this indication here is when I shift, is when I become more self-reliant, 
these things start showing up again. And the only way to overcome these things is to become more spiritual, more God relent, more access to power. And when I have access to power, these things are not even a thought. I don't work on these things. So I see these things are a byproduct. When I'm more instinct based, I'm more driven by these things selfish, inconsiderate, dishonest, self seeking. Anybody here? So it becomes really interesting. So in order to not have these problems where it caused me guilt, shame, and remorse that we're going to get into later, what do I need to work on? I need to work on my spiritual condition. We'll get into that recipe later. So that's really interesting stuff, eh? It's kind of, anybody seen the four step sex inventory done like that before? No, yes. we, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But most of us just like, oh, what did I do? Who did I involve? I've just involved me and the other person. We don't see how really this area touches every aspect of our life. And a lot of us are driven by this, right? So it's kind of, did you want to add anything to that, Joanne? No, no, that was good. Joe, Joe disappear? Uh, no, I think he's still around. Joe, you want to add anything to that? I don't know where he is. Okay, so we got that list. Now what do we do? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. So, so what's the purpose of this is to see where I am and what got me here and where the problems are and to re-look at, at what's driving me to for a future, my future sex life or my future relationships, my future ideas to what the first time I seen this recipe, I was 16 years sober. I did it the other way. The, the old way with the Joe and Charlie is like the old sheets, it was kind of like this. Well, what did I, who did I hurt? What did I do? How did I, and I, and I never built the same idea for the future. So I was still being dri driven and, and kind of directed by self without knowing it. I was still using these areas to bring about a sense of security and well being and relief from self. This is the area that caused me most of my problems when I was unable to see it. So when I first got sober, my resentment list was through the ceiling. My fear list was a little smaller. And then my sex conduct was, right? So the list kind of went like this. As I got sober, it started reversing the other way around. My fear list went right through the ceiling. My conduct list became secondary. And then my resentment list subsided. So I realized this thing here, this relationship one, has been one of my downfalls my whole life. Anybody? So if I'm going to be free to have a new experience with my relationships, I need to find out a new way of doing things. And at 16 years sober, I redid this recipe with a sane and sound idea. And I put it into practice for three months, not being driven by my instincts when these things were would happen where where instincts were trying to take over i would pray look for relief go work with another person and then somewhere along the line i did this prayer again when to yield would mean heart we get into it later and a half an hour later when i had a heart to heart with god half an hour later i met my wife she's annoying me that's a story all in itself but I would have never met her or have the relationship I have today if it wasn't for a sane and sound idea for the future. How many people have done inventories here before? How many people have done a sane and sound idea for the future? In, in, at 16 years sober, I've seen that. All the other times we've done an inventory, I never had a separate list of a sane and sound idea that I talked to my sponsor about. Very few people have. I've never really heard any speakers talk about it. I've never seen anybody do it, but I've seen people who've been through the big book study or good sponsorship who just stick with the book. That's one part of the exercise in the inventory is to come up with a sane and sound idea. So then what does it say? We subjected each relation to this test was it selfish or not? So this is the second list. Now we put in every relationship I've been in. We subjected each relationship to the test. Was it selfish or not? So if Kim, Kim and I, I 
back when I was, so that self that relationship wasn't selfish because we both agreed to be in it. But some of the things that happened in that relationship were selfish, inconsiderate, and dishonest. So that's on the first list. This list is, and then there was Brenda. Was that relation? Yeah, that relation with Brenda was selfish because back then I was doing certain things and engaged in certain things. She was involved in certain things, and we traded off our relationship based on certain things. It was a trade-off, right? I'm not going to get in because this is is a public forum, but I'm not. But most of you will get the idea. In order, so it's, it's kind of like a barter system for rent. It's kind of like that. Men and women do that all the time. Men do that also. They barter, women barter, whatever that looks like based on your instincts. A lot of us will get involved in a relationship because of the payoff. Well, because I need help with this, or need help with the rent, or this, or that, or self-esteem. So we put ourselves in a position is a trade-off. Nobody Quid in this pro. group. Quid pro quo. Yeah, nobody in this group, right? <laughs> yeah. So, like, uh, um, Shirley didn't drink, so I ended that relationship, and I got involved with a woman who drank just like me. Was that selfish? Yeah, I was selfish. Because <laughs> so, that's, so I subjected each relationship to the test, which ones were selfish and not. And a lot of them weren't because we both agreed to be in it. But some of them based on motive, right? When, when I worked as a bodyguard, I, I turned around, and some of the women I would help get from one dancing job to another dancing job because I'd escort them in between gigs and I'd get involved with them. Was that so? Yeah, 100%. Selfish, right? So th there's not easy things to look at, but it's part of, of the game, right? Same with the bar life, same all that other stuff. Like, so, but a lot of them were okay too. Does that kind of make sense when I look at each relationship? So even though there were selfish acts in that relationship, that would be in the first list, right? The second list is I subjected each relationship to was it selfish or not? So I have two lists. Does that kind of make sense? So that's a lot of, a lot of work for next week, I think. Right? Here's a good portion of the sex inventory. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know what? There's probably a lot of different ways. I've found in the last 31 years that we've got tried to get more to the book as possible because this really is the underlying stuff. You know, it's not the act. It's not the things. It's what caused me problems. What What is it that's driving me? What's making my decisions for me, right? What's created all my failed relationships? And do I want to continue to have the relationships I've been having, or do I want a new experience with a new idea? Do I want freedom within my own relationships, or do I want to be prison? I've created more prison hostage-taking situations than I care to admit to. Nobody in this group, right? Do it like I've done serious time in some relationships, and sometimes even alone I've done serious time. <laughs> so it works two ways here. There's there's the things that causes problem in a relationship and there's also the flip coin of that is there's stuff that happens with inside that keeps us out of relationships it's the same coin the inability to have a relationship or having the wrong kind of relationship or if i'm in a relationship how can i make that relationship look different but i need to narrow it i need to have a sane and sound idea so the way when I, we get together every once in a while and 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 we revisit our relationship. What's how? How do we want things to look? How do we spend more time being more constructive, to be more inclusive? To what are the things that are interfering with our relationship that are causing us emotional, mental, or spiritual distress that we could do differently here? We revisit how we want our relationship to look as we go along. We kind of revisit this idea here based on this information in the book. You want to add anything to that, Joanne? No, oh, that's great. So next week we'll continue on. Um, we're going to do a bit of house. So read through it. See what you get out of it. We'll continue on. It's really good stuff. This is a real game changer, right? And same with the fear stuff. So the tapes will be available to you um, afterwards. If you've kind of gone too fast, you want to go back over it slowly, you can download them or kind of listen to them on the YouTube. It's just audio or on the Facebook also. Joanne, do you want to talk about the seventh and the importance of that? Um, Kim, do you want to talk about the seventh? 
Yeah, just let me copy paste it. Um, so the seventh tradition is being collected not only to cover the group's expenses, um, but also uh, we still have to pay rent to the buildings that we normally host this meeting in um, when we're allowed to go out of our places. So we still need to make um, our payments uh, and our responsibilities, um, as well as donations to the seventh tradition. This happens every time. Um, the four levels of service are getting donations from uh, this group as a whole, which is 164 and beyond. Um, and if you want to have more information on how we are dividing the money, you can come to our business meeting on Monday night at 6.30 Pacific, 9.30 Eastern. Um, we're going to be doing another large split to the four levels of service as well to pay our expenses as we are responsible to do so, even though um, we're not attending our buildings. Did I miss anything? No, no that's just, just so everybody's clear that this meeting generally meets physically um, when we're not having a pandemic and, and, and trying to practice social distancing every Tuesday and Friday night in Vancouver, BC, and every Wednesday night um, in Langley, BC. And we continue to pay rent to those facilities. Um, and the seventh tradition collected tonight goes towards the paying of rent at those facilities as well as the four entities of service. So your seventh tradition is, is being used wisely. Um, and Kim's put in the chat there um, how, to, how to contribute if you're in a position to do so. But just to be reminded that there are no dues or fees for AA membership. Contributions are, uh, are optional. Right on. And uh, if you're getting a lot out of this and, and you're enjoying these uh, talks and big books, please uh, let us know and let other people know. That'll be awesome. And uh, we'll close with the uh, third step prayer for those that wish. Would you tell them how to find the YouTube page or should we just get them to? Yes, I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat here, how to how to get through to the YouTube page so that you guys can, um, can get caught up with uh, the previous workshops that we've had Tuesday and Thursday nights and some of the other talks that Tony's done around town. Um, and I'll also put the instructions on how to get LinkedIn on our Facebook page. Um, on our Facebook page, you'll see um, the Big Book Study Workshop Sheets we've been talking about quite a bit tonight. Um, and, uh, and and that's a way to stay connected even outside of these meetings. Right on. So we'll close with the third step prayer. What's the first requirement in making this thing work? God. God. I offer myself, myself to, thee, to thee. To build, to build with, with me and me to do with me, me as thou wilt. Will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may that better, I better do thy will. will. Take away Take my away difficulties, the victory over, over them, may bring witness, witness to those of thy power, of thy power, thy love, love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Live long and prosperous. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Tony.